Hello, everybody, and welcome to Talking Trees Live. Hey there, Michael. Hey, how are you? I'm great. I am your host, Katie Dubow, and today I am joined by Michael Sumberg, an arborist out of Denver, Colorado. So please help me welcome him. We've already got people commenting and saying hello. So you said it was a little cloudy there, which I know from my experience, Denver gets like the most sun of yeah. any, any city. So that's rare, right? Yep, I almost need to pick me up today because it's so gloomy compared to normal, but I'm gonna probably survive and make it till tomorrow and get good sunny day. So yeah, I all is well. So. How has your weather been out there? Oh, you've already gotten some snow, haven't you? We got a little bit of snow, like at a kind of odd time of year with um, like early fall, but then after that, it has been just bone dry. So interesting. Yeah. Well, that'll be important for our conversation today, because if you are tuning in, you probably saw that we are going to be talking about evergreen trees, which for people like me who live in the Northeast, people like Michael who live out West in the Northwest, they are that spot of fabulousness in the wintertime because our trees lose the leaves, but we still want that green in our landscapes and they provide that for us. But if your trees are looking more drab than fab, um, there are a few tricks that Michael will help us today figure out how to make sure your evergreen trees are healthy. So there are things that you can do now, you know, even though it's getting colder, there are, there are some important steps that you can do now to make sure your trees are healthy. So we wanna hear from you though. We wanna hear where you guys are tuning in from. So first let us know that. Are we talking to other Northeasters with a lot of evergreen trees or tell us, we've got some Midwesterners, Midwesterners and um, Pennsylvania. Um, let's see, so of course our Ohio friends. So. Oh, yeah. Um, we also want to hear from you guys about your questions. So we're here to talk about evergreens, but of course, Michael is an arborist. He's been with Davey for almost 10 years. Um, and so he'll be able to answer your tree, tree care, your burning tree care questions. Although yep. I, that's, that's a bad play on words. Um, but also you're born and raised in Colorado, right? So you're, you're probably an expert. You guys have a lot of evergreen trees out there. We do. Yeah. I mean, it's mostly pine and spruce, but obviously you can get some Doug firs and some, you know, true firs mixed in there. Um, plenty of people have junipers as far as like screening and just general landscape. So um, it's not a, an enormous list because of how tough it is to grow trees out here with our crazy weather and dryness. But um, yeah, they definitely bring a lot of, you know, good greenery all, all season. So super important for our landscapes. I had a friend who was born and raised in Golden, Colorado, and she said growing up, she was like, that story of Little Red Riding Hood getting lost in the forest, she never understood because yeah. of the thick density of our Northeast and other air Midwest, so we have these thick forests. I never really realized, obviously Colorado is very mountainous, um, but she, that was such a funny thing to me. She's like, Little Red Riding Hood, just climb up to the tallest mountain and you know oh, where yeah. you are. Yeah. And especially for like, you know, anything Denver metro area, it's, uh, you know, it's basically a high altitude desert by default, but we all have trees just because we can irrigate. But, um, you know, the only place you're going to find trees that are meant to be is going to be up in the mountains for more native settings. So, yeah, interesting. Well, let's talk evergreen. So obviously we're coming in. I know people who are already getting their Christmas trees. That's not what we're going to talk about today. Tune in December 2nd for a chat on Christmas trees. But Evergreens are such an example of winter. You know, we we see that whether they're bare and they're green and the rest, everything else is brown or they're snow dusted and just absolutely sparkling. They really are that winter tree. Uh, but a lot of people have problems with them. In fact, you know, one of the most common questions that Davey gets on the blog is caring for evergreen trees. So we're going to talk today a little bit about um, how we do that and how you make sure they look really tip top shape. First, we're going to address what an evergreen is. So I think a lot of people might, you know, if you're too, if you're new to trees or if you're not an arborist, so would you help us understand the difference between what makes an evergreen tree and maybe a deciduous? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, evergreens are going to be something that holds on to their foliage for more than one season. Um, so, you know, a lot of people think immediately pines and spruce, but there's also what's called broadleaf evergreens, which are going to be leafy, but don't drop their leaves. Um, they might change a little bit of color in the fall and winter, but uh, they're still going to hold on to those leaves and use them again next year. So, so like those would be more our shrubs, right? The broadleaf or ones yes. like boxwoods and cherry laurels and yep. Gotcha. Um, what's your favorite tree? I would say bristlecone pine. Um, that's going to be the the tree that's the same species that has the oldest tree, you know, on the planet. So, the, a very 
longevity driven tree and yes. uh, cool foliage. Uh, it's you know, needle, needles have little white resin dots on them. So they got a little extra like kind of snow dust appearance on them. Oh my gosh. And uh, just a slow, steady, strong tree for sure. I love that. I have to look that up. Um, Sandy's asking already, why do evergreens stay green? Like what makes them do that rather than lose their leaves? Oh, it's just the way that they've evolved. And um, that's just the branch they took with, you know, tree evolution that they can keep those leaves and needles and use them instead of uh, drop them and just kind of go into a dormant season and hang out till the, the following spring. Um, they, you know, they still grow year to year. So it's not that they're like stagnant. Um, every year they're pushing new growth, just like deciduous trees are, but you know, they just can utilize their needles and they're, you know, winter proof, so to speak. So. So they, do they technically go dormant in this, even though they're not dropping their leaves, like our regular, you know, maples are, are they also going dormant in the winter time? Yeah, I would call it dormant because they're not putting new growth on, um, you know, they're just sitting in a bud stage waiting for the next spring. And then from there, they're going to push that next ring of growth, whether it's, you know, your trunk ring that we all count rings with, or it's the tips where it's putting out new height and width to the tree. So. Interesting. We have another great question from Kelly. She's asking one of the best evergreens for privacy. Uh, we will get to some popular trees in a little bit, but do you have any off the top of your head? I mean, I know there's some very common ones. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, upright juniper is probably one of the most privacy ready ones that can be bred in different heights and widths. So it depends on what kind of space you're planting. And some people have like a super narrow channel between their house and their neighbor's house. So a lot of trees are going to be too wide, but upright junipers, they have some that are, you know, maybe three to five feet wide at maturity. So tall and skinny, and they might be 20 feet tall and three feet wide. So you could grow those as a, a row. Um, they're also really hardy. So it's, it's tough to, to kill a juniper, um, even when you want to kill them and, and remove them. <laughs> but that's probably the best one for privacy and screening that's evergreen nice. and, and tough. For sure. We just got another question about that too. So I guess you guys are interested. All this time spent at home, we realize our neighbors are outside. We're outside. We need a little bit of privacy. Even if you love your neighbors, yeah. privacy is important. Um, well, that's great. Upright juniper, that's a great tip. Um, you guys let us know what your favorite trees are as well. We want to hear from you what you love in trees, whether either for privacy or just your favorite evergreen tree in general. Yeah. So um I know that a lot of our trees, as you said, some of them will go through these maybe a dormancy or whatever semi-dormant stage. But what's the difference in a tree that is starting to brown when it's natural? How do we? How can we tell that that's natural, and when can we tell that it's a problem? Yeah, that's a good question, and we get a ton of calls on that um, every year. So even though they're evergreen and they hold on to like leaves or needles um, year to year, they still have the you know their incentive is to have their energy brought from the sun by having their growth on the exterior as their, you know, source of the most light. So then the interior needles, there's less incentive for the tree to, to keep clinging on to those if they're not producing much energy. So uh, it's very natural for evergreens to shed their interior needles or interior uh, leaves. And then, you know, they're just kind of relying on that outer shell as their best source for energy. So that's uh, a common one we get where somebody calls because they've got brown needles. Um, you know, we go out there and identify that it's just the interior that's browning and it's usually like a, their oldest one year's worth of growth from four or five years ago that's dropping and everything else from that point forward is still really healthy. So that's a really good distinction because Jen's asking, do evergreens lose their needles? So yeah, they will. Absolutely. Um, part of that natural aging process you're saying, but can there be a time when that's showing stress? you know, when yeah. they're losing their needles, how can we tell the difference between when it's just not normal besides calling an arborist, which is the most important thing. Um, what's a good indicator? We're out looking at our tree uh, in the difference in just natural stress and maybe a pest. Yeah. I'd say like the best way to evaluate your health of your evergreens is their exterior. So if you have browning on the tips, browning on the tops where it's like the, you know, the end of the branch is brown or the, the very top of it is brown. That could be more of a concern and more of a red flag for sure. Um, you know, there's various things that can lead to that. So that takes a little bit more diagnostic ability to figure out like, you know, is this something to really be concerned about? Like the tree is shutting down and not putting out new growth and it's just browning and it's going to die. Or if it's just something that's more pest or disease related that you can try to manage. Interesting. All right. So browning, this is not the rule, but right. um, if there is browning on the interior, then that's typically natural. 
Yes. But if you've got browning on that exterior where you have new growth, or even if come next spring, you don't see new growth. Yeah. Um, but now you're not supposed to see that new growth. But if you've got that tips or the top where the sun reaches, yes. you see browning there, that could be a problem. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, if you think about how a tree is going to be drinking up water, the tips are probably like the farthest place away from the roots. So if it's thirsty and it's not getting enough water, the tips can show that first because that's the farthest place water is not reaching now and then it's drying up. So. So let's say our tree, I mean, I know a lot of regions The New England had a, suffered from a bad drought this year. You guys, you just talked about how you've been in a, a extreme dry period. What are some things we can do now? Is it important to water our trees now if our evergreens are suffering from dehydration? Yeah, and I would encourage it for healthy or stressed. Um, you know, a lot of people, once you blow out your sprinklers or once you get into that cold time of year, we all kind of bunker inside and forget about the yard. But um, you know, the evergreens are still doing the same process as they do all year with needing to pull up water and use the sun for energy. And so um, they really benefit from winter watering. So that's um, if you don't have the ability to have your sprinkler system running, which most people don't because of, you know, freezing, um, you're just pulling out a hose or calling us to come out and deep root water for you as a service and uh, just providing that supplemental water to bridge that gap until the next spring um, for, for winter watering. So about once a month is the basic recommendation, but it's not that the evergreen is going to say no if you did it, you know, twice a month or weekly. Yeah. If it's really dry and windy and sunny, um, you know, that's how we are out here. They stuff it can't get enough moisture in the winter time, and it's just provided by by humans by hand. So it's the only place they really get moisture from. Particularly if I know we've had a lot less snow than we have had in the past. You know, 10 years ago, this my area of Pennsylvania, we got tons of snow each year and now it's not happening as much. So that snow that would melt then into the ground in the spring is not happening. Yes, it's still raining, but um, so it is important to make sure we are deep root watering. And I love your tip there. Um, you know, a sprinkler will do the, the crown, but, but with an evergreen tree, you know, I know with a tree that the limbs are up a little bit from the ground, I can run a sprinkler and it won't get the leaves, you know, wet. But how about with an evergreen? Would did you rather do like a, a soaker hose or something there? Yeah, it, it's probably like the best way to try to give it the most slow watering you can because you don't want anything running off the surface and yeah. going down into the neighbor's yard or down the street because then you're just wasting it. So like a good, good steady trickle or doing it like with a deep root injection where you can go below the soil and just get it right into the roots. Um, you know, definitely following that kind of drip line outer edge of the canopy as the most, I don't know, important part of the root system that's drinking the most water, but you're just ideally trying to apply water to underneath that drip line. And, um, yeah, any way you can do it, it, whether it's an overhead sprinkler or just putting the hose out on a trickle or having us inject it directly under the ground, all, all helps for sure. Yeah, just don't waste it. Yeah. You don't waste it. Important water is. Yeah. So we've got a couple of questions before we get to some other issues with your tree. So Eric is asking about plants that grow well underneath white pine trees. That's very specific. I don't know if that you have any suggestions there. I mean, yes, we would need shade. Yeah, I don't know definitely Costa. shade. Yeah, um, yeah uh, Japanese yew would be a shrub that comes to mind. That's going to be more of a shade tolerant shrub. Um, you know, most things need good sun to be really healthy, but I'd say for something that's sort of adaptable for that, you could look into. Um, either like a Japanese yew, I maybe even consider like a holly as something that could maybe tolerate those conditions. Nice. Thank you, Eric. And make sure it's well mulched under there. It's hard to plant. Yeah. I know a lot of plants, um, it's hard to grow under trees because you don't want to hurt the roots of the tree that's already there or compete. The trees like you yeah. talked about, they want to suck up all the water that's possible. So finding something to go under a big tree is sometimes a challenge or can hurt your tree. Yeah. And it's just tough in general. I mean, if you think of like a mature forest, the, uh, you know, the undergrowth is going to be pretty minimal stuff just because there's just no sunlight. But um, if you can get some good filtered light through there, then I'd say something that's shade tolerant would be okay. Mm -hmm. So another question from Heather, which is another kind of specific, she has an evergreen in a pot that has bees. So the pot, the, I guess there's a nest uh, and she wants to spray it, but not hurt the tree. So I feel like bees would, Heather, tell us where you live, because I feel like they would be um, dying back at this time of year. I think a general consideration if you have um, bees and if you're talking about spraying, I don't know if she's talking about water spraying or like pesticide spraying, but I would, I would probably avoid the pesticide side of things if there's any bee crossover um, and explore if you can do any like direct injections or something if it's big enough for that. Um, but yeah, watering, I don't know if I'd be able to help much if there's a, a watering and a bee hive crossover. Yeah. 
Um, and I also think if your beehive, if you're trying not to harm your beehive, they probably will hibernate depending on where you live. Um, Jen has another question about, we're, talk, we're talking about water, you know, with a lot of our house plants, we know when they need to be watered, a lot of them will tell us. With, an, with a big tree, what are some signs? I mean, are there signs that, you know, you, to, you told us about the browning tips. Um, yeah. That seems to be like an almost too late. So yeah, they're, how they're can we slow. tell when they need to be watered? Yeah, they're, they're slow to talk. Um, trees that have, you know, stresses or issues don't just reach out and put their hand up and say, I need water now. Um, they're, yeah, they're slow to, to tell you there's a problem. And then once you're rectifying it or getting that water, you're not going to see like an immediate fix either. So it's a slow process. Um, you always want to be in, on the front end of that and just doing the proper maintenance so that you don't even get to that point. Um, once you have something that's, you know, really drying up, it's hard to, to kind of catch it and get it turned around in time. Um, and then once you are watering, I wouldn't expect it to like immediately just bounce back yeah. and be like, I'm good now. Thanks. House yeah. plants like definitely talk quickly when they're dry. Um, so that's a big contrast to a tree is that they're, they're slow and yeah, they don't talk very well. Well, I know there's some sort of measurement. Is it, um, an inch? I mean, if you haven't had rain in a week, you know, you know, especially in a month, you you know, you need to water your tree, whether it's telling you that or not. I know there is a measurement of like an inch per trunk diameter per week. Look it up if you don't know it. Yeah. Uh, you know, for us, I mean, this is kind of regional potentially just because Colorado, we're so dry, but like, um, you know, our, our Colorado state university recommends 10 gallons of water per trunk inch tr tree diameter. So it's a ton of water, but ultimately, as long as you're watering, you're doing the right thing. If you're falling X amount of gallons short, uh, the tree won't judge you. It's not going to, you know, start to just decline and die on you. It's it's going to take whatever water you can provide it. But that's kind of like maybe your monthly goal you're shooting for over the winter time is that 10 gallons per trunk inch diameter, um, which, you know, if you have like a 30 inch trunk, that's a, a lot of water. But that's yeah. probably what the tree is going to, you know, utilize throughout that month. So you can kind of consider that a watering it's so fascinating though. It just shows you how deep those, how important the roots of the tree tree are. You know, we did this whole topic on soil a couple of weeks ago and it's that hidden underground mystery that that much water, we're not, we're not providing that. That's the tree is getting it from the soil basin and, you know, yeah. from the rain and from runoff. And it's just, it's a miracle. It's amazing that trees are able to do that and do their work and stand and provide us with all those benefits. Yeah, it, that's the hardest part about tree care is the underground part of it because you can't see it. There's only so much you can do to, you know, like sample it or dig down there or see what's going on with the roots. Sometimes roots will double back around a trunk and girdle it under the ground and you can't tell uh, easily or ever tell. And then you have problems in the canopy that result from that. So it's that's the biggest part that's hard to manage perfectly and you, you just can't see it very well. So uh, but water water is the biggest part of the soil profile that the tree is going to need. So. And that's why having an arborist out is important. But there are some things that you can see, like pests and diseases. So those are, you know, although I have a hemlock back at my house that I was going to clip, but I forgot today. I have woody adelgid. Is that how you pronounce that? Adelgids, yeah. Yeah, and you can see them on the tree. So there are some pests and diseases that you can spot. So are there common? I know there's so many species of evergreens, but what are some things that we could be looking out for? How do we inspect our trees to know we need to call our arborist because our tree has some sort of pest or disease? Yeah, I'd, I'd say like general rule of thumb, if you have evergreens and you can physically see something crawling or walking on the leaves and needles, it, it probably could be a problem. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, the tree doesn't like have coexisting insect partners that help it, you know, and some sort of like symbiotic relationship. So if you're seeing, you know, creepy crawlers all over, I, I'd probably say it could be an issue. Um, you know, for me, I'd say like our pines, we can get a lot of giant conifer aphids on them. And so that's something that's really visible to people. If you brush into a branch, you'll have them on your arm and you'll wow. feel and see them. And it, it spurs some phone calls because it's pretty unnatural seeming. Um, other times they're a little harder to see or might need a hand lens, you, you know, going into like spider mites. Um, if you're seeing a lot of webbing that isn't just regular spider webs, um, that could be a problem with mites and those can be pretty damaging. So you'd want to act quickly and hop on the phone uh, in that situation. So, um, you know, the insect side of things, um, there's either going to be ones that are, you know, physically on the branches and needles or leaves that are kind of sucking some energy from the tree and, um, you know, may not be fatal, but could be a big stressor. And other times you could have like, you know, a bark beetle issue that actually could be devastating to the tree. And you'd want to be on the preventative end of that and, and uh, keep that out of the equation. Cause that's 
damage to the point of no return with those two. So. Yeah, I mean, and you think about it, replacing a tree like that would be so much more expensive than treating and caring for it. So caring for our trees, preventing the spread of these pests is so important. Um, I think, you know, to the health of our trees, the health of your landscape, we know that trees add so much curb appeal and value to our home and to, to us. So I think getting ahead of pests and diseases and even just a checkup, you know, like you said, maybe like a spider mite or something wouldn't kill your tree, but if your tree's already suffering from that drought, they're going to yeah. move in. You're because, doubling down on problems. Yeah. yeah. Um, another interesting problem that I've, I never really have, I don't think I've seen, but I know evergreens can suffer from like, I'm not going to, it's not called sunburn, but it's kind right. of like sunburn, yep. right? Yeah. Sun scald. And uh, even deciduous trees are going to have the potential for that. And that's basically just too much sun. And uh, especially on like younger bark, younger branches. Um, in Colorado, we have a real big problem with that because we have so much sunlight we're at a higher altitude, so the sun intensity is greater too. So we get a lot of damage from sun salt, sun scald on, um, you know, tree trunks, upper limbs, um, and then you know, frost cracks to go along with that, where the sun kind of warms up the tree during the day, and then you get one of those sub-zero nights, and you get a big, you know, 60, 70 degree temperature swing just on the wood tissue itself, and it can cause cracking and damage. So, yeah, it can be it can be too much sun. I mean, you think they always want sun, but they can get too much on more sensitive tissue and it can be a problem. So what can we do for that? I mean, is there like an aloe treatment like for yeah, your skin I, or, or sunscreen spray? Um, yeah. yeah, I'd say like the biggest thing that you can do would be a uh, tree wrap over the winter time. Um, that's kind of like a November through April sort of timing, just when you have those potential for big temperature swings. And um, I, that's just a kind of a cardboard material that you can wrap the tree with. Some of them are burlap, so it, it all just depends. As long as you're putting some kind of a covering, it acts as like an insulator and a little mm -hmm. bit of a protection. I've I've got one client that just puts up like a a cardboard like rectangle over the trunk of their tree just at the angle the sun hits it. And I was like, oh, that works. But yeah, the wrap is easier though, so it's yeah. it's pretty simple and it's cheap too. And that's only if you need it. I mean, we don't need to be doing that to our trees if they're not suffering from sun scald. I shouldn't go out and right. do that for all my yeah, trees. Yeah, and bigger trees, mature trees, they they take care of themselves because their bark is thicker and textured. But younger trees, it's the biggest ones. And so, like, uh, if it's still like that baby bark, that smooth bark, that's going to be your biggest problem with sun scald. And then, you know, that warrants tree wrap versus a you know a thirty year old pine. You're not going to wrap. Yeah, there's no saving my skin from sun. No, I still wear sunscreen all. Yeah. It's important. Same, uh, yeah. Well, it's kind of to that point, Courtney's asking if it's too late. So for those baby trees, is it too late? I know this is so regional, but what would your suggestion be for planting trees? Um, do we have like a, once we hit our first frost, should we not plant trees anymore? Or what, what's your suggestion? Uh, that'll definitely be regional. I mean, trees going into the ground in the fall is wonderful for them because the biggest problem with planting a new tree is that you have like this very small root area that's going into the ground and has very little access to water. Um, when you plant trees in the fall, it's a great time to put them in the ground because then they have cooler temps. The roots can just go explore the soil. It gets kind of set up for next spring. And then once the summer heat hits them, they've got some roots set. So um, for Colorado here, it would still not be too late. Um, I don't know about places more north if it's just getting too wintry and just, you know, frozen ground trying to go into. But, um, you know, I, I think Colorado is a great time to still be planting. The one downside for us, I don't know if that's the same for other regions necessarily, but the, the nursery selection sometimes can be picked yeah. over. Yeah. They don't refresh that all year and then you're you know better off waiting till spring. But that's true. Or sometimes you can get really good deals. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Especially. Yeah. There's some that might have like a little aesthetic thing that just yeah. people are turned off by. But the tree itself is fine. And, in you know, whatever amount of years it grows, it looks great. And yeah. you don't even know it had a problem. So, yeah. All right, so we talked about some problems. You could have dehydration, pests and diseases, sunburn or sun scald um, to your evergreens. What is the point of no return? I mean, is that when you, you need to call an arborist and they don't take down your evergreen? Because maybe it could be saved, you know, yeah. but when can it not be saved? Are there points where you're just, this bark beetle has devastated it too much? Yeah, your, your biggest thing that would be, um, you know, a tree that's to the point of no return for, for sure, if it doesn't put out new growth in the spring, it's going to be toast. Uh, trees have to grow and put out new growth every single year to be alive. So if your tree didn't break out its buds and push new growth that next spring, um, that's going to be a major problem. Um, just for total needle loss, if you had something like that, where I'd say probably if you've lost half of your, your foliage, your tree's going to be in trouble because the roots are going to have a hard time replacing that as they tell the top to grow and replace. Um, 
it's definitely case by case though. I mean, there's yeah. going to be times where it's like, okay, is this tree kind of in trouble, but not a tree you were in love with and you already have other plans to replace it. Maybe you just go with that plan and replace it. But if it's a, you know, front yard tree, that's just total curb appeal and providing shade for the house that you really need, you're going to want to probably put all the resources you can into it to make sure you can try to save right. it. Right, because the great thing about evergreens, I mean, our deciduous trees obviously provide that shade in the hot summer, which can reduce our cooling bills, but evergreens can block wind. I mean, I know yeah. lately, this so far this winter, I feel like it's been wind, wind, wind. So many wind advisories that I have seen. And when you have a, a properly placed evergreen, it can do so much for your heating bills. You know, yeah. it, can save, it can save you money. I don't know what the proper placement is for wind, though. I guess there'd be no, like sun is one thing, but yep. wind can come from any angle, right? Yeah, sometimes there's more prevailing winds and you might plan your yard that way to try to at least block that majority of the time, you know, north wind from the north that you're getting or something. Um, one consideration I would mention with evergreens is you want to try to watch where you would be shading like a driveway or sidewalk. Cause then if you do get snow and it turns to ice, you're never getting any sun on there. So it's, um, one of those things Great that probably, that. you know, north side of a, of a driveway, uh, could be dicey or, um, and that's another part about planning is you could try to have your deciduous trees on the sunny side of the house where they, you might want the sun in the winter time just to heat the house and then put your evergreens on the other side. Um, but you know, it, it just all varies yard to yard, but um, wind breaks are great too. Cause with the evergreens, they're gonna just yeah, eat up the wind and block it for you, so. I love that, great tip. Um, I had a eight month pregnant year old woman, I mean, eight month pregnant woman slip in my driveway because I had a improperly placed, she was fine, but improperly placed evergreen. So great tip. Yeah, so much better to go to Sigmas there. Yeah. Matt, your question's really interesting because we know about fall foliage and how like you go to New England, at least here on the East Coast, for leaf peeping. I'm sure Colorado has some great, you know, where do you go for leaf peeping? Is that a thing? Uh, for us, um, definitely the mountains. Aspens, yeah. I mean, it, it's, yeah, if, you, if you're spoiled with all the rich colors you get out East, you might not be impressed by aspens, but it's really cool if you go up to the mountains here because you get uh, just bright yellow and then you have like the evergreens around them too um so that's your best place here I and mean, driving around denver and in, in in town you're going to get some colors with some reds and yeah you know a little yellow a little orange here and there but there's not as much diversity in the fall color here as you get oh. like out east but yeah uh, when you don't think about someone asking like what's the best state for evergreens is there a one that's like famous for like it's densely populated forests, like the redwoods, you know? Yeah, I, West Coast for sure. I mean, you go Oregon, Washington, California yeah. for your most impressive, just monster evergreens. Um, and they're just a good example of what good moisture does. Um, you know, those places get so much moisture off the ocean and have yeah. way higher humidity, more frequent rain, uh, rain. They're way happier trees out there than when we try to put evergreens in our, our desert here and then underwater them, so. That's, there we go, back to that moisture. Yeah. Um, well, Kim has a question. We were kind of talking about wind before and Ohio just had a really bad windstorm and she saw a pine that snapped in half. Um, is that a tree that you might suspect was already suffering from some damage? I mean, that's- Most likely, yeah. yeah. That's like the, the strength and the bread and the butter of the tree is gonna be the trunk. So for it to snap in half, usually you're gonna have some kind of a defect or, or issue that the tree may have already had. Uh, not to say any, you know, certain amount of intense wind eventually physics wins is what i always tell people like there's only so much a tree can do with so much force but you know the trunk and large branches if they're properly attached to the trunk those are usually able to withstand you know massive forces if they're healthy and don't have you know a, a hollow cavity or a defect or rotting or something like that um uprooting can be a problem uh no doubt i think for us it's the spruce trees out here they're uh, just big wind sails because they've got such yeah. dense needles top to bottom and they catch every pound of force when the yeah. wind hits them so they they're more prone to to topple over just from physics basically than anything else and um you know you always want to you know examine your tree risk if if your spruce is over you know right next to a busy street corner that may be more of a reason to pause and think you know if this were to fail what's the consequence versus a tree at the back of your yard that might you know, be prone to fail. And if it does, it, it's going to happen, but nothing's yeah. going to really, you know, be bad about that. So. So do we prune our evergreens? I mean, I know deciduous, you won't, you don't want it to act like a sail. Um, are evergreens pruned in the same way? I mean, you wouldn't, you want I them would, to be dense. So yeah, I would say not really, you know, there's times where you have to for an obstacle or it's you know, rubbing the house or stuff like that. 
Um, but you're not generally just taking an evergreen and pruning it just to like thin it out. And mm -hmm. um, the way they grow helps them out too, because everything just comes straight out of the middle of the trunk and pretty much, you know, I guess if we're talking about like pines and spruce and fir, it's a trunk and then branches just come off of the main trunk. So you don't have as much of like a spreading canopy that's gonna um, act as a wind sail in different ways. So I would say um, less on the evergreen for pruning. Um, you know, junipers, those upright junipers, people want them to look, you know, really yeah. upright and stay really tight. So that does require some like frequent shearing or pruning, um, but probably like your, you know, more forest trees, they're not looking to be just maintenance pruned and taking yeah. off a lot of live growth because you want them dense, like you said. Right. Right. Interesting. High winds have been such an issue um, lately. I mean, I already said that, but I, Kim, thank you for your question, because I think knowing when to have your tree inspected before that happens. So things that we can do now so we can have our trees, you know, have and Davy Arbors come out and check our trees now before big storms hit. Right. You know, yeah. that's a great thing to have an arborist come out and consult with you. Maybe not for that pruning for but for dormant pruning for your deciduous trees, for sure. Um, what are some other things we can do to our evergreens now besides watering? Maybe that would protect them that, that we haven't talked about or we've covered. Um, yeah, I'd say there's, there's going to be some cases where you might consider putting in cables or rods into the tree. Um, if you have like a, a pine or a spruce or, you know, larger tree that has, um, you know, co-dominant trunks or basically at, like at a young age, two trunks competed to be the main leaders. So they're just growing side by side, uh, racing to be the main trunk and they end up, you know, as a kind of a big tie, but yeah. they, they're not very strongly attached to one another. So sometimes it warrants putting in a cable in that um, between the two trunks and maybe a rod through the trunk where it starts to split just to reinforce, um, you know, it's not a hundred percent foolproof that it still can't fail, but you're adding a lot of assur you know, insurance to that tree that it's got some support. If it does get that, you know, wind applied to it, that half of the tree doesn't break off. Um, so that's, that's probably a big consideration where you have like, you know, co-competing trunks, um, yeah that can be a red flag and, and worth some hardware to put in. And what about mulching? Do we want mulch our evergreens? I feel like a lot of them hit so close to the ground. Do they need, I mean, I know everyone can benefit from some mulching, but I never really mm -hmm. thought about that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, some of them kind of mulch themselves because they do have that like low canopy. And then as they drop those interior needles, they kind of create their own mulch. But um, a lot of times you can, you know, one up that, or if you have a pine tree that doesn't have a lot of coverage underneath it, it's just bare soil or, um, something like that, you can put down mulch, which helps insulate the ground It makes your watering stretch further because now when that moisture is in the soil, the sun isn't cooking it and just having it evaporate off because you've got that insulating layer. Yeah. Um, helps with temperature swings too. So mm -hmm. um, we always recommend, you know, one or two inches of mulch at the bottom of a tree. Um, if you can eliminate that turf competition too, where you've got grass growing up to the trunk, that's not the tree's favorite thing to, to deal with, but something you could do like a mulch ring to, uh, add a little buffer zone and also keep the mowers from hitting it too. Right. So, Right. But my favorite thing, if you've seen this before is do not vo volcano mulch. People. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> do not volcano mulch. It, it almost makes me pull over my car when I see it. Cause me I just want to like pull the mulch away and just, you know, fix it. But um, yeah, you don't want to just pile it up around the trunk. Um, you don't want to trap moisture there. That, that tissue is meant to be dry. Your roots are meant to be wet, you know? So that's where, you're in a kind of a transition zone between your roots and your trunk when it comes from the ground up to the trunk area. But you want that mulch as just a couple inches, just like you'd have out in a forest. Um, the forest doesn't, you know, make volcano mulching and that's how trees right. are the happiest. So we know that that's not meant to be when people do that. So. Yeah. Well, we talked about this a little bit in the beginning, but Courtney's talking about trees, evergreens that are dying from the bottom up or top down. And she's asking you to explain that. So if you guys are just tuning in, uh, I know this is a really, you said in the beginning, a common question that you get about why are my needles turning brown? Um, and so let's go bottom up. Let's say they are dying at the bottom. Yes. And you said maybe that's not such a problem. Yeah. So if you have like a bottom up issue, a lot of times that can be from sunlight. So can be a very natural process. Um, trees, limbs at the bottom, now they're getting shaded from the canopy up top. Those limbs are not getting enough sun anymore and so they might drop their needles um, and then just perish and you know you might prune them off or, or whatever, but that's usually the cause of that. Um, another thing I see a lot is where people have like had to cut their branches where it's the, you know, the low branches are into their lawn um, and they've you know cut a branch in half because they want to make sure they can get by with their mower but now that branch is cut in half the needles that are left are way tucked underneath the, the sun and then the branch just says okay i'm done why don't you guys just take it from here up there yeah. <laughs> so pretty pretty natural um you know for us um 
ponderosa pines naturally do that on their own. So like a, a perfectly healthy ponderosa pine, even if the sun is hitting it really well, can lose lower branches. And that's one of their ways they've evolved to deal with forest fire too, to not have the ladder fuels all the way to the bottom. So. So you mentioned though, cutting that out. I mean, can we, let's say we don't like the look of it or something, or it's right in our front yard mm -hmm. and there are some lower browning needles. Can we properly prune or have yeah. our arborists properly prune those out? Will that hurt the tree? Yeah, so properly prune is the biggest the biggest point there that I like. Uh, so you're, you're typically trying to just work on the exterior with as you know minimal of a, a process as you can, right? Because the tree doesn't want that limb cut in half. But if you do need to do some pruning, you want it to be light, you want it to be on the tips taking it back to, you know, good suitable branches or branches that are equal sized. Um, mm -hmm. You don't want to take like a, a four inch limb and cut it back to like a half inch little sprig. The tree's not going to be okay with that. Yeah. So you're typically just going with, you know, lighter cuts on the ends. And then it kind of goes down to like a bigger maintenance thing is that you're keeping up on it. So you might have to do that every year just to keep that good barrier from where it's too close to the house or the lawn. But then you're always making those small, less invasive cuts that the tree will tolerate better. Um, then just like, okay, this thing is, should have been done 10 years ago. Now I'm just going to chop it in half and see what happens. Yeah. No, don't do that. And have your arborists come out. I mean, that's, yes. what, that's what arborists are there for, to know how to make those proper pruning cuts. That's um, right. And, and you, especially with your evergreens, that it's not something that needs to be done hopefully every year. It's just to maintenance. And, you know, if you don't like the browning look, maybe just get used to it because it's natural, except yes. maybe if it's dying, as you mentioned, from the top down, now that might be a sim symptom of a greater issue. So talk to us about yeah, that. Yeah, the top down would be more of a concern because like your tree's bread and butter part of having growth hormones and pushing new growth is the top. You know, if you think about the shape of just about every tree, the top is the tallest, it gets the most love, the tree puts on the most growth out of the top compared to the sides. You know, that's how you get that conical shape with like mm -hmm. uh, spruce trees and fir trees. If the top was having an issue, you would definitely be concerned because that's like your most important part of the tree. Um, we had a really bad freeze this past April and we had a lot of pines get the entire top frozen. So just the top foot, top three feet, top five feet, whatever it was, depending on the tree, a lot of them just froze and have big dead tops with orange dead needles on them that are sticking around. and. In some cases, those trees are going to have to pick a lateral branch to curl upwards and become a trunk again and grow straight up. Um, in other cases, it was too much lost and the tree had to go. But um, yeah, the top would be a, a concern if you had something on the, the top of the tree, um, pest or environmental issue, um, worth, worth a checkup if the top is messed up. Yeah, and now is a good time to spot the browning needles. But then again, in spring, if you see or don't see new growth, and I, you know, I know that just w give it some time. Not like the first day of spring. Give it right. yep. till summer till you. Yeah, don't follow the down. calendar. <laughs> yeah, don't have some patience with your trees. Um, you know, like you said, in April could be still cold. So get, have some patience. But those two are good times to check up on your tree. Although you should always be looking at your trees, getting outside, and enjoying what they have to offer. Jen has a great question about needles. And I know this is a big thing in the South, pine straw mulch. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, let's say I'm up here in the North, are, do needles make good mulch for our trees or should we be removing them? I would say they're they're good, but not perfect. Um, any mulch is good. I mean, even if people put rock down, it beats bare soil. So if anything that's acting as an insulator can be good. Hmm. Um, but, you know, in a forest setting, the needles are the mulch and that's just what the trees use. And it's great because they're recycling their own resource at that point. Um, if you're using like more of a, a mulch from like a wood chip or like a bark mulch, um, it might be a little bit thicker, um, it may be better insulating, but um, I wouldn't have, you know, any objection unless you have a, like a fire concern with that. If it's yeah. just you know, dead dry needles versus maybe bigger chunks of wood that aren't as likely to catch on fire. But, um, you know, anything is better than bare soil. And then um, at that point, I would I would always try to go with something, you know, organic in nature. So if it's the needles or the mulch versus rock, but um, rock still counts as a mulch and has some benefits because you don't have to fluff it and change it out. Um, but it doesn't really have a lot of nutrient cycling happening either. So, yeah. Yeah, interesting. That is so great. And so things you guys can do now that Michael has shared with us is you're watering. So we need to be continually watering our trees through winter, whether you want a professional to do that, that's something Davey can do. Deep root, or what's it called? Yeah, deep root watering or subsurface watering, yep. Yep, so getting it down to the roots where they need it, because you really need to do a slow trickle. You don't want that water running off 
you know, into your driveway. Another thing I want to do is pull my car over is when someone's watering their driveway. Yeah, um, yeah <laughs> but, exactly. And, and then you can be mulching your trees now. So yep. if you don't have that layer of mulch, make sure they are protected to help them get through winter. You mentioned cabling and yep. uh, maybe bracing if your tree needs it, but that certainly is not something you would do yourself. Please. Correct. Yeah, definitely call uh, professional, call professional for that. I've seen some good homeowner jobs with some ratchet straps and crazy things that, you know, like technically work, but the way that the tree is going to grow, end up choking the tree because yeah. it's a strap instead of a, a rod that's installed and things like that. But yeah. Um, yeah, definitely good for a phone call to a pro for that. And um, yeah, then tree wrap too for the, the younger trees. Right. Yep. Right. Well, I think we're going to have some fab evergreens this winter. Um, I know that, you know, we did talk about pests and diseases. And I think one thing I just to, to go back to that one too, another thing you could do now is if there are pests or diseases, would now be a time to treat them? Or are you waiting until spring to treat for pests and diseases? Uh, it would all depend on which one, um, you know, you've got, because some of them are going to have like a very finite window for treatment that if it's not in the right window, you're just, you know, Wasting, wasting it. it. Yep. And yep. then other times it could be the perfect time to put down a product or application to address a problem. So. Got it. And it's important to know what pest you're treating for too. I mean, you know, yes. Heather or someone mentioned bees earlier and we're not just spray, you know, Davy is not coming out and just spraying your tree. So it's important to know a lot of times it can be another, a deep root pesticide. That's not what it's called, but. Right. Yeah. Um, like a systemic or an injectable. Okay. Yep. Definitely. Yeah. And so, you know, Davy is really, there to protect your trees, but also to protect wildlife. Protect you know, your bees and everything else. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So that's what a professional can do for you. So um, we want our evergreens to be looking beautiful. We want all of our trees to be looking good. And that's what Michael and his crew at Davey will do for you. So I think we got everyone's questions. We had a ton awesome. of great questions today. Um, thank you, everybody, for, for asking your questions. And thank you, Michael, for your expertise and your knowledge. It was really fun to learn. I learned I learned a lot today, too, about evergreens and pine straw mulch. My mom grew up in South Carolina, and I feel like it's everywhere. But it's yeah. this thick. So, you know, to get that here in Pennsylvania, that's not – you don't want to – pay for pine straw mulch a layer that thick so right yeah with my regular old mulch yep absolutely yeah well, thank you for having me and i was uh, glad to answer questions and that's that's what we're here for for folks we we love trees we love questions we love to help people and make sure their yards can look as best as possible so awesome well everyone's saying they learned a lot so we appreciate it um i'll be back in two weeks not with michael but i will be back in two weeks on december 2nd and we'll be we'll still be talking evergreens but this time we'll be talking the kind that you bring in your house um cut and what is the best christmas trees and how to care for them and we might be joined by a guest in a red hat so we'll see about that um my kids will be really excited about that because we're not going to see santa this year because he's on quarantine. So tune in on December 2nd, you might see somebody. So thank at 3 p.m. Eastern. So thanks again, Michael. And thank you, everybody out there. Have a great yeah, day. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Have a good day.